I have a quick question, actually. So yesterday you uh, mentioned that the finite mind cannot know the infinite mind, and I'm on board with that. But I have an, uh, a difficult time with the uh, other side of that, which is you said the infinite mind cannot know the finite mind. Do you mind explaining that a little bit? Because I've heard it yes. said before. Yes. And... Yes. Yes, Anna, in order to know something finite, we must stand apart from that thing and know it in subject-object relationship. Let's, let's, let's first of all take as an example the act of seeing. Uh, you can see the screen in front of you because you stand at a distance from it. You can see the wall behind your screen because you stand at a distance from it. If you were to hold your, your finger three inches from your eyes, you could see it. Why? Because your eyes stand at a distance from your finger. But you cannot see your eyes. Why not? So the infinite mind doesn't have the... Hold on. Hold on a minute. I want to go slowly with you. You cannot see your eyes mm -hmm. because you, you, your eyes cannot stand apart from themselves and look back at themselves. So in order to know something objective or finite, we must stand apart from it. And whatever stands apart from this finite object that we wish to know must itself be finite. It must be localized. Yes. So a finite object can only be known by a finite subject. Okay. Now take the infinite. If the infinite... The, in, in order for the infinite to know something other than itself, it would have to stand apart from that thing and know it from a distance. Where would it go? I... If it... If it localized itself, it would become finite. And that's what our finite minds are, a localization of the infinite. So it's because the infinite mind is so at one with experience and th because there's actually no separation, then it can't know separation. Yes. But, and not only can the infinite not know separation, you, you're right, it can't. It cannot separate itself from anything. It, it cannot know objective experience. D d d d let me take another example. Um, d just take an, an, any object. D take this glass. You can see this glass because you view it from a localized perspective, one point of view. Now, imagine um, a glass is not a very good object because it's, it's a symmetrical object. To, to take my hand instead, you, you can see my hand because you see it from a, a localized point of view. But imagine that there were 10 people sitting. I'm imagining that you're sitting here in my in my room. Imagine there were 10 people sitting here, all around here, and they were all to see my hand from 10 different localized points of view. They wouldn't see one hand, one clearly defined hand as you see. They'd see 10 different views, and each view would be different. What they see would be more like a cubist painting than a single object. Yeah, it would be a... a, a... Now, the, if the infinite were able to see my hand, it would have to see my hand from all possible points of view in space. Well, what would my hand look like? Oh. It wouldn't look like a hand. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't look like anything. It would just be black, darkness. So not only does the infinite not know separation, but the infinite doesn't know any finite objects from which it may or may not be separate. The infinite knows nothing, but is what we call everything. 
Now, why do I say the infinite knows nothing? I've already explained that. Why do I say, but the infinite is what we call everything? Because for the infinite, there are no things, let alone everything. We've already just understood the infinite cannot know a thing. So everything, there's no such thing as a thing or even all things, everything for the infinite. Everything is only, a, a thing is only such. A thing is only a thing from the point of view of a finite mind. All things or everything is only everything from the point of view of a finite mind. So for the infinite, there is neither a thing or all things. The infinite knows nothing of things. The infinite just knows itself. And that complete, utter absence of objectivity or separation or distance, that is the experience of love. And we get a taste of this every time we love someone, because when we love someone, we feel that the separation between us diminishes or collapses. And as a result of that collapse of the sense of separation, we say, I love you. Actually, in the, in the experience of love, there is no I or you. That's why we love love, because in love we disappear as a, as a separate person. So every time we feel, I, I love you, I love a person, what is really happening then is that the infinite is, is filtering through into our temporal experience, giving us a taste of itself. Um, yeah, by the way, I've been doing the, the shared being meditation that you mentioned, and it's oh, good. really, really, I've been doing it every day. It's really powerful. Lovely. Um, good. Good. Okay, so intellectually, thank you. I, I get it. Um, I think it still bothers me a little bit, though, because it feels like it's a limitation on God. And if God has a limitation, then I feel that it's not God, if that makes sense. So, you know, if, if the and infinite... Uh, limitations, is, yeah. limitations are only limitations for a finite mind. God knows nothing of limitations. Because in order to know a limitation, you must know a form. And in order to know a form, you must stand apart from it as a separate subject of experience. God knows nothing of such things. But... Wouldn't a limitation on the infinite mind be the fact that it cannot see the hand without the localization? No, you are mind? presuming that the hand is really a hand, and then oh. you're asking, but why can't God see it? Okay. But the hand is only a hand from your limited point of view. You you are you are imposing your the limitations that seem real to you and believing that they pertain to God. The hand is only a hand from your limited point of view. God knows nothing of such things. You're trying to bring God within the compass of your own finite mind. Do the opposite. Surrender your finite mind to God's infinite being. How do you do that? <laughs> the way you're doing it. The way you're doing it, exactly the way you're doing it, Th like through these costs, by exploring, pushing, challenging, objecting, exploring in your experience, gradually your mind will surrender. No, it, it won't. It won't resign. It, it will just. It'll surrender through understanding. So, Rupert, I, I have had that experience. Actually, it's very much like what Marius was describing, but I'm finding that, and I don't know if this is just the finite mind or the separate self trying to stay relevant. <laughs> Does that happen? I mean, because how could I have that experience of what you're just sharing right now of by, you know, by doing this process, I had the recognition and then I feel like I'm coming back again where the, the mind is still pushing to try to understand that, that's good. You you should give your mind complete permission to raise every objection possible. And and that that's why in this approach we don't just dismiss the mind's questions and say, oh, don't try to understand. 
with your mind, put your mind on one side, discipline your mind. No, we give free reign to the mind. And some people's minds, like, like yours, are very inquisitive and investigative and don't want to leave any stone unturned. They want to ask every single question and they're not going to lie down until every single question has been answered. Not, not by somebody else, but, but by yourself. Mm -hmm. And other people find these conversations a little intellectual, which is fine. They, they just no need to listen to them. But for those of us, and I, I have a mind like you, for those of us that want to explore and question and challenge and object, and then you, you should give your mind permission to raise all these objections because your own mind will, sometimes with, a, with the help of a friend, but ultimately it's your own mind will bring itself to its own ending again and again. When I, what, when I say bring itself to its own ending, that's what understanding is. When the objection of the mind dies and that, that's, that the mind comes to an end, that is the experience of understanding. And you, you will bring your mind to its own end over and over and over again until you'll find there, there are fewer and fewer questions or objections. I, I, I did what you're doing for, 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 for 30 years. 35 years, relentlessly. And then slowly, 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 I noticed that my questions, my objections, my resistance, it, it petered out. It's not, 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 I, it's not because I suddenly thought, oh, I know everything or I understand anything. It wasn't like that at all. It was more like all the objections of my mind subsided and just this, the, the, the unity of being it just became clearer and clearer and clearer. I think I understand. I've I do meet those points where it kind of dies down, and instead of yes. rising or seeking, it's just this. Oh, I don't need to continue. Yes. It, yes. That, that. And, and then and then maybe the next day another objection rises. Then then you meet it. You explore it. If you you may be able to more and more, you find you'll be able to answer your own questions. But if 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 you're not able to, you have a conversation like this, and 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 then the mind subsides again. Okay, so it's um it's just the process. Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Rupert. I appreciate Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.